Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon, um, Cabbage Stem Flea Beetle. I'm Rose, and I'm based in the northeast of, of the region, and I'm part of the Knowledge Exchange team for cereals and, and oil seeds here at AHGB. Um, behind the scenes, bailing us out as we go along is Christian, um, an absolute superstar. We've also got Steve Ellis from ADAS and Tom Pope from Harper Adams University. So this evening, um, we're going to have a very efficient webinar. I know the football's due on before too long, and I'm sure there are many of you um, that will be itching to get on to watch that later. So just quickly to go through the housekeeping, you are all on mute this evening. Um, but if you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat box on the right hand side. There should be a few tab options there. Um, and like I say, you can put your questions in there for us. Um, the majority of the questions, unless I sort of deem anything burning, they will be asked at the end. So please, you know, as we're going along, um, stick them in and, and tell us, ask us what you're thinking and what your thoughts are about the discussion. Um, so we're kicking off now. Um, this webinar is due to finish in an hour's time. I don't want to go too far over. Um, I'm sure I'll be getting told off if I do for those keen football enthusiasts. Um, and basis and Neuroso points are available. Please pop your details in the box on the right hand side if you stick your membership numbers in there. However, when you registered, if you filled in your details then and put your basis and Neuroso numbers on your registration form, you don't need to do this again. So just those of you that um, haven't already, um, pop them in that chat box on the right hand side. Um, and our webinars, as always, they are recorded. Um, so if you would like to watch this again, um, it will be available on our website. Um, so quickly, we're just going to have a, a quick look at the Yen Establishment Beauty Contest for 2021. I think Steve might touch on this in his presentation. Um, uh, in due course, but we are now encouraging growers to register um, for LCG and at drilling so that they can provide information about their crop as it establish, establishes. And this can contribute to improving the industry's understanding of how we successfully establish oilseed rape in the face of cabbage stem flea beetle um, and other challenges. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. Oh no, we maybe haven't got a poll, have we, Christian? Yeah, I can run it now. Is that, sorry. <laughs> we just thought we would have a practice poll before we got started. I know we've got a couple coming up during the presentations. So, <laughs> is football coming home? Um, yes, no, don't care, they're all over prayed. So, what's everybody's opinion this evening? Is football coming home? Yes, no, don't care, they're all overpaid. If you click the box. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So we'll see what happens in, in due course this evening. Thank you very much. Um, fabulous. So this evening's webinar, um, knowing now that we have a lack of effective chemical options in oilseed rape, um, which has accelerated the rise of cabbage stem flea beetle, um, of which I'm sure the majority of you um, are well aware of the problem, and it is enemy um, pest number one in this crop. Um, and with its management resting on rapidly developing um, variable and complex set of alternative solutions, um, this evening we're going to start with Steve Ellis, so um, very shortly I will pass over to him. Um, who's going to discuss IPM as a potential solution, um, but will we require a change of mindset to go with this? So, Steve, thank you very much. Um, I'll pass over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Rose, and good evening, everybody. And could we have the next slide, please, Christian? And bearing in mind what's likely to happen in the next two to three hours, I don't really want to be the one to temper everybody's expectations. But I think it's fair to say that in terms of cabbage stem flea beetle control, there certainly is no silver bullet. As Rose has already said, chemical control options are very limited. 
we've got widespread resistance to pyrethroids and I guess the only real option for us is integrated pest management. Uh, next slide please. Now if we're going to go down the route of integrated pest management I think we really probably need to uh, change our mindset in terms of what we're expecting from the various control options that are available. We've been spoiled over the last two to three decades, I guess, by having pyrethroids, relatively inexpensive, broad spectrum, very effective insecticides. But now, as I said, resistance is widespread. IPM is, is a totally different kettle of fish. And it's a strategy which is built by combining a number of control options. And I don't think we can really expect any of those individual options to give us the level of control that we might have got from uh, a single spray of an insecticide. So what we're really talking about is combining a, a series of options so that ultimately we can develop a strategy for control of cabbage stem bee beetle, which is roughly comparable to what we might have got from insecticides in the past. Uh, next slide, please, Christian. So what we learnt about cabbage stem flea beetle over the last few years that is going to help us to manage it in the future? Well, first and foremost is that so date is primarily important in determining the, the, the pressure, pressure from the pest. And you can see here summarised in this table how we feel that sowing date will determine the stage of the pest that you need to target. So if you're if you're sowing early in the year, then you're primarily going to be time targeting the larvae. If you're sowing from mid-August to the end of August, you're probably going to have problems from larvae and adults. From early to mid-September, you're in a similar situation. And if you're sowing late from mid to late September onwards, then you're primarily concerned with controlling the adults as larval numbers will, will decline. I think it's probably important to say that this is assuming that we have sufficient so soil moisture, because I think soil moisture is the one thing that can override all of these factors, because if the, if the soil conditions aren't right, it clearly isn't worth um, drilling the crop, because that is only going to increase the potential problems. Uh, next slide, please. So, so why do we think that these uh, that different sowing dates are affected by uh, the pests in different ways. Now, this, this is a slide of adult monitoring back in, two, in 2020, where we used what we call raised yellow water traps, which are water traps about a meter above the ground, which intercept cabbage stem flea beetle as they're migrating into your crop. And you can see that where, where the slope of the graph is greatest, that's when we're getting the peak migration. And generally speaking, uh, in this particular year, we, we, well, generally speaking, we would expect peak migration to be roughly mid-August to mid-September. But in 2020, it was probably slightly later and occurred maybe early September to mid-September. And it can vary from year to year. But generally speaking, um, the earlier you sow, you're likely to avoid the uh, problems with the adults, the later you sow, then um, you, you, you're likely to get adults, um, but lower numbers of larvae. Next slide, please. Now, the, the data that we collated from the last cabbage stem flea beetle project allowed us to look at the various agronomic factors that affect pest pressure. And one of the things that, that Came, came, to the, came to the fore was, was drill date in terms of minimizing adult damage. And this is basically looking here at the stage of cabbage of uh, crop development, which is most susceptible to cabbage stem flea beetle adult attack. And not surprisingly, you can see here that the, the greatest level of damage occurs when you're at the at or, or early emergence and as the crops become more developed, they become more robust and able to withstand um, some loss of green leaf area. So, so this ties in with our, our information about the, uh, the migration 
in that ideally you don't want your crop emerging at an early growth stage when the peak migration is occurring. Uh, next step, slide, please. But of course, that there's also an impact on the larval numbers. And the interesting thing here is that you can see that the earlier you sow, the greater the number of larvae you're likely to, to see. This is again data from um, the old Cabbage Stem Fee Beetle project. And you can see that um, crop sown before the 11th of August had significantly more larvae than those sown from, uh, from the September onwards. And this is simply because the, the plants are exposed to beetles for a much longer time. There are more eggs laid, temperatures are lower. As a result, the eggs hatch more quickly and the larvae develop more, more, more quickly. So the earlier the crop is sown, although you might avoid the larvae, then, sorry, you might avoid the adults, there is still potentially a problem with larvae which you might have to deal with in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So if we, if we combine all this information in terms of sowing dates uh, with the various options we have for control of the pest, you can start to draw up a picture of the various components of integrated pest management strategies you might have available to you depending on your sow date. And you can see from the mid-August through to mid-September, there are far more ticks in the table. And this is obviously the stage when you're at greatest risk from cabbage stem fee beetle attack, because generally speaking, that is when we, when we have peak migration. But prior to mid-August, we're, we're primarily concerned with trying to control the larvae, because the chances are you, you, you will have robust plants before the, the, the adults actually arrive. From mid to late September onwards, then we're looking to control the adults, because we know that larval numbers from those late sowings will be much lower. Next slide, please. So if we're going to control the various stages of cabbage stem flea beetle, what options do we have available? And I want to go through a, a number of things now that, that we've, we've looked at over the past few years and we're continuing to look at. The, the list is by no means exhaustive, but it does give you some idea of the sort of options that, that we're investigating. Now, firstly, one option we're considering is you leaving volunteers as a means of uh, avoiding the, the, the adults. And that the simple idea here is to provide cabbage stem flea beetle or adults with an alternative food source which will uh, lure them away from any emerging crops. And you can see here that the that clearly that this was effective. We resulted in 63% fewer larvae where we used volunteers as trap crops. Providing we left the, lar the volunteers in place until late September at least, and also that we had a significant area of volunteers as a, as a way of, of distracting those um, cabbage stem flea beetle. So it protects mainly crops from mid-August sow dates onwards and is, is a very effective, what it looks like to uh, being uh, a very useful way of, of controlling adults. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the other op option that, that we're, we've been considering is the use of organic amendments. And the simple theory here is that you use an organic amendment to mask the odour of the oil seed rape seedlings so that the cabbage stem flea beetle larvae are unable to detect the crop. Now, from this initial graph, you would, you would tend to assume that uh, where we apply chicken muck and artificial nitrogen, then the results were not too promising because clearly there, there are more larvae present there than there were in the control. Uh, but if we look at the next slide, please. One thing that uh, was very clear that was where we applied the chicken muck, then the plants were that much bigger than where we, uh, in the control plots, and also where we applied the artificial nitrogen. So those plants were much more robust, they were much bigger, and as a result, they were able to tolerate 
uh, higher numbers of larvae. So if we could look at the next slide, please. If we take into account the fact that those plants were, were larger and then calculate the, the number of larvae per unit length, then you can see here again that where we use chicken muck, there was certainly a reduction in the numbers of larvae in comparison with where artificial nitrogen was used. Um, it was similar to the levels in the control. Granted, there, there weren't huge numbers of larvae present uh, in this particular trial, but the results were statistically significant. So the question is whether or not chicken muck has that X factor and is able to mask um, the, the odor of cabbage of Aussie rape seedlings and also perhaps provide some additional nitrogen, which allows the crop to grow away and, and as a result, uh, develop more robust seedlings which are better able to tolerate attack. Uh, next slide, please. Now, another option we can use for controlling adults, and you've probably heard quite a lot about this, is companion crops. And from the work that I've looked at, there, there appears to be two ways of doing this. And firstly, is to just grow Aussie grape in the presence of other crops, um, with the intention again of somehow uh, preventing the cabbage stem flea beetle or adults from detecting the young developing Aussie grape seedlings. And, and this has been the, the approach that we've, we've investigated in the past few years. Now, there is an alternative, and that's where you provide the uh, cabbage stem flea beetle adults with an alternative food source, so perhaps a mustard crop, which they actually prefer to feed on rather than the orseed rape. And the theory there is that the, the beetles feed on the mustard, feed on the alternative crop, the orseed rape seedlings are able to grow away, and as a result, um, they're, they're able to tolerate attack. But in, in our particular instance, we were looking at three particular treatments that we've got a control treatment there and then we've got two cover crop mixes one from frontier and one from limograin which we complain which we compared in um, field scale trials uh, next chart slide please now in terms of the results this is the percentage of adult uh, damage or loss of green leaf area that that we found in the three treatments and you can see that at the two growth stages, these are early growth stages, 10 to 12 or 14 to 15, there was significantly less leaf area lost where the crop was grown in the presence of a companion crop and compared with the untreated control. Again, not huge levels of damage, but um, consistent results uh, across both growth stages. Next slide, please. And these are just some pictures uh, of the companion crops at the end of October. And you can see, I mean, the, the main thing I think to pick out from this is that in the presence of the frontier and limit grain companion crop mixes, you can see there is, there is much more plant material and you could easily conceive that it would be much more difficult for a cabbage stem flea beetle adult to find uh, a young developing seedling in that situation than it would in, in the control. Um, next slide, please. Now, an another possible option for controlling adults, which there's been quite a bit of discussion about, is stubble management. And this is basically whether or not you leave the, the, the cereal stubble uh, short or long. And this is some evidence that we we've developed from three sites that we've monitored um, over the last year, where we have um, three sites, as I said, one, two, three, you've got V1, V2, and V3, which are basically uh, cabbage, uh, all seed rate varieties that are left with long stubble or short stubble. And FS just stands for the farm standard. So that was the, the host farmer's own crop which he also uh, provided stubble, which was both long and short. And you can see consistently across the three sites, there was a lower level of leaf area lost where the stubble was left tall in comparison with where it was left short. 
and the percentage values that you see above the bars are the percentage reduction in leaf area loss that was achieved by producing a long stubble rather than a short stubble. Again, how this technique actually works, we're not 100% sure. We suspect that, again, there may be some way that the, that the cabbage stem flea beetle or larvae are unable to detect the developing seedlings. But it's also been suggested that the presence of the long stubble allows um, beneficials, things like um, uh, uh, money spiders and the like, to build webs, which are, are able to trap the uh, the migrating cabbage stem flea beetles. Uh, next slide, please. Now we move on now to controlling larvae, and we did do some work initially looking at seed rate as a means of controlling adult cabbage stem flea beetle. And the theory was that if you increase the seed rate, you increase the number of plants and therefore you potentially dilute the amount of damage that beetles can do to individual plants. But when we came to analyze the data, we actually found that there was no difference whatsoever in the numbers of larvae per plant at the different seed rates. And you can see that from the, the bar chart on the left-hand side. What we did find, however, was that by increasing the seed rate, you increase the numbers of larvae per meter squared. So potentially you're increasing the, the problem and the, the pest pressure for the following season. So we're now starting to think about whether or not we can reduce seed rate as a means of combating larvae. And the hypothesis here is that by growing plants at lower seed rates, we tend to produce much bigger and much more robust plants. We've, we've worked with a number of farmers and they've used this technique and effectively ended up with almost like small trees. And as a result, those plants are much better able to tolerate large populations of cabbage stem flea beetle larvae and yield well even in the presence of those larvae. And that's something that we're, we're looking to investigate in the future. And next slide, please. Something that we investigated in the last project as a means of controlling larvae is defoliation. And this is a very, very simple technique because what we discovered was that we'd always been told that cabbage stem flea beetle larvae over the, over the winter start to move from the leaves inside the stem where they're better protected, that it's a warmer atmosphere. Um, but what we found in practice is, was that right through until maybe March time, the larvae were still present in the leaves. Now we know oilseed rape has a great compensatory ability. So if you lose leaf area, then it, quite, it very easily grows back. So what we did was simply defoliate the crop in December, January or March and measure what impact that had on the larval numbers. And you can see from these results, that we were able to reduce larval numbers by about 55% in plot trials. And when we, we transferred that to field scale studies using toppers and just sheep to graze the oil seed rape off, again, we were able to reduce numbers of larvae by about 51 to 25%. So very effective at reducing numbers of larvae. Of course, next child, please. Next slide, please, sorry. Um, unfortunately, that didn't always transfer to uh, a yield effect. And in fact, what we found was that where we defoliated the crop, quite often the, there were yield losses. And we suspect that was to do with the, the weather conditions in the spring and any conditions that were unfavorable to the, the, the plants meant that they were, they were unable to compensate for the defoliation. But it's interesting to know that um, some of the people who took part in these studies are persisting with defoliation because it provides them with a very effective means of reducing the number of larvae that are present in, for their subsequent years. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly now, um, the, the current project, which is run by my colleague Sasha Wright, reducing the impact 
of Cabbage Stem Phoebe or on Orsi Rape in the UK. And these are the various project partners we have involved, of which, of course, Tom is one. And uh, if we move on to the next slide, these are the plan trials we have for the 21-22 season, where, where we're looking at ways in which we can combat adults and larvae on field scale studies. So in terms of the things that we've already discussed, we're going to be looking at companion crop trials, where we're comparing buckwheat with buckwheat and bursine clover and buckwheat, bursine and clover and fenugreek. We're looking at organic amendments again, and uh, I think the key here will be to apply the organic amendment as soon as possible uh, or as close as possible to when the, the, the crop actually emerges. Uh, we're interested in stubble length again, because as I said, that appears to be have an impact on the, the numbers of adults that are able to, to find the developing seedlings. And we're also going to be looking at seed rate and again, going down to low seed rates, which I agree is, is a pretty risky option. But if we can get it right, it does provide us with very robust plants which are able to tolerate um, uh, cabbage stem flea beetle larval infestation. And those are the trials that we're planning this year. If anybody's interested in, in being involved with those trials, by all means, please contact me via email or give me a ring and uh, we see where we can go for the future. And I think that is the, the last slide, Christian. Brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic, um, Steve. And great to see what options um, we have of targeting adults, um, larvae or, or both, um, and the plans for, for next season. Um, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Tom Pope, uh, who's going to give an update on research um, to provide a better understanding of how temperature affects the biology of cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, and then in addition to that, the future research um, to investigate risk factors going forwards. So thank you very much, Tom. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, so as Rose said, I, I'm going to look at um, the uh, next few slides at uh, improving our understanding of cabbage stem uh, flea beetle uh, biology. As, as Steve has already said, we've been somewhat spoiled over the last um, few decades because we've had really good chemistry to control uh, pests such as cabbage stem flea beetle. Uh, and what we found uh, in a number of cases, and flea beetle would be, would be one, is that when we come to look at the, the management of cabbage stem flea beetle, there's some gaps in our understanding of the biology, and that's because we didn't need to know the biology as well uh, previously because we had such good uh, chemical controls. So uh, next slide, please, Christian. So we've seen this slide um, already from, uh, from Steve, and as Steve said, um, the work I'm gonna talk about mainly in, in, over the next few slides is part of this um, uh, uh, HDB um, uh, project uh, led by um, Sasha White at uh, ADAS. And the bit we're involved with at Harper Adams is really focusing on temperature and how that affects the biology of cabbage stem flea beetle. Uh, next slide, please, Christian. Uh, the other project I just want to touch on just at the end is um, uh, again an HDB uh, project, uh, this time um, uh, partly funded by um, uh, AFCP and CERTIS and working uh, with colleagues at uh, University of Warwick. And here we're looking at some of these uh, novel approaches um, to cabbage stem flea beetle control, trying to look and see if there's some biological solutions, uh, products, uh, biopesticides that we can apply to the crop in order to uh, get a measure of control against uh, cabbage stem flea beetles. So that's fairly early work, but I'd like to, to flag up uh, some progress that we've made um, just at the uh, end of uh, uh, the, the, um, this section this, uh, this evening. Uh, next slide, please. So if I start by just um, going back a step, and Steve's done, uh, uh, you know, given us an overview of some of the uh, the approaches that we can look to uh, for the uh, for the control of cabbage stem flea beetle within an IPM uh, system. And as I'm sure you're very aware, and as you got the impression from Steve's um, presentation, that um, what we're looking for is stacking a number of uh, controls together. We don't have a magic uh, a magic bullet. We don't have a silver bullet to control this pest. But if you think about its um, biology. Um, uh, we know that cabbage stem flea beetle has a single generation uh, a year 
the, uh, the young adults emerge in the late uh, spring after pupating in the soil. And if you look at the, the photograph on the top right, that's the um, uh, cabbage stone flea beetle. Um, but you would find if you dig around in the soil uh, in uh, spring and early summertime, it's one of the stages of the life cycle that we tend not to see because it's hidden in the soil. You won't see it unless you're, you're, you're having a, a really detailed look. The, the adults um, uh, that emerge, they feed on leaves, stems and pods um, in the summer, summer months. This doesn't really cause uh, any damage. We're not going to be aware of this, uh, this feeding. The adults then enter a period of dormancy in sheltered places, hedgerows um, uh, between uh, uh, in the soil, cracks and crevices in, in the soil, where they're basically sitting out um, uh, the, uh, the rest of the summer before um, um, they, um, uh, they become active again, and then they migrate into crops uh, in the uh, late summer, early autumn. Uh, next slide, please. So many of you would have seen uh, the uh, HDB monitoring, but as part of this um, uh, ongoing um, flea beetle uh, project being communicated uh, last, um, uh, last uh, August and September. And so as you can see uh, in the, uh, the map on the left-hand side um, from the 17th to 21st of August, we're starting at that point to see uh, flea beetle adults within oilseed rape crops. And if we fast forward to the 14th to the 18th of September, we can see that that's really ramped up uh, to much higher numbers of flea beetle. And we're also seeing flea beetle across the whole of um, uh, the sampling, uh, sampling area throughout much of uh, 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 England through the, uh, the sampling, uh, sampling regions included in this, in this project. And that brings me back nicely on to, Steve's already mentioned that last year was a little bit later that we saw um, flea beetle adults moving into oilseed rape crops. So we've got a poll here um, on the next, uh, thanks Christian. Uh, just to ask you, when do you see peak adult activity? And I appreciate that uh, uh, that may vary uh, from region to region, but it'd be really interesting to know. And it's one of the uh, aspects of the, the ongoing project to understand whether um, we're seeing peak activity in early to mid August, uh, mid to late August, early to mid September, mid uh, to late September, or at some other time. Uh, so it'd be really interesting for your thoughts, uh, thoughts on that. So we'll just give it a second or two uh, for you to uh, uh, to vote. I'll close it in about five seconds time. We've got just over half people voted now, so last few seconds. Fantastic, thanks Christian. Fantastic, okay, so most people seeing mid to late August through to early to mid September for peak adult um, activity, so that, that would really um, fit fairly well with uh, what we saw uh, last year. I don't know if you want to come in on that at all, Steve. Is that what you would have largely expected? Yeah, uh, that, that's it's it's quite quite reassuring, Tom. That um, everybody seems to be seeing the, the same sort of thing because that that does help us in terms of developing strategies to control the beast. Because if we're going to go early or we're going to go late then we're targeting different stages of the past and we can we can home in on what we can do to control over the adults or larvae so that yeah that, that was that was quite interesting and quite reassuring yeah great stuff Thank, thanks steve and it's worth saying that that work will be repeated again this year and again next year with the uh, the um uh, survey as part of this project to see when the adults are moving into crops so so keep tuned for that. Those results will be uh, published in the same way um, over the coming uh, the coming season. Uh, next slide, please. So just to complete the the flea beetle um, life cycle. So the, the the adults are moving into the crop, and then um, as we've already heard plenty about uh, this evening, the adults start damaging the crop. We we see this um, shot holing um, damage. And that's really the stage where the adults are um, they're feeding in order to become sexually mature. So the adults, when they arrive in the crop, they're not ready to reproduce just at that stage. The feeding that we see, the damage that the adults cause is as a, um, a, a finishing off their development. Once they've done that, then the eggs are laid. And that's what the bottom um, photograph is. That's cabbage stem flea beetle eggs with these um, uh, uh, almost like a yolk in, in the center of the, uh, the egg there. Um, so these are laid around the base of um, the plants. Egg hatch is um, thought to be determined very much by temperature and humidity, and we'll come on to look at that in just a moment. 
Um, eggs begin to hatch anywhere from we think around late September uh, time and then the larvae uh, climb up onto the plants and they penetrate the plant the leaf petioles. So uh, if you look at the plants uh, very carefully uh, from late September onwards, you'll see a, a little scar where the, uh, the larvae have burrowed into, uh, into the plant. And then as Steve was saying um, a few moments ago, the larvae start off in the, the leaf petiole, the leaf of the, the plant, but then they may move down into the, the stem of the plant. But that typically happens very late in the growth of the plant. So that tends to be not of any additional significance. It's really the, um, the, the, the initial feeding by the, uh, by the larvae that is gonna be most uh, concerning to us. Uh, next slide, please. So I said that the, there's a gaps in our knowledge about flea beetle um, biology. And, and really, if we look at what we know about um, uh, cabbage stem flea beetle uh, biology in relation to temperature, we have to go back about 50 years before we find um, the last study that looked at the, uh, uh, the impact of temperature on cabbage uh, stem flea beetle uh, biology here in the UK. And so what that found was that the timing of adult invasion of the crop is in autumn and subsequent attack on the plants by the larvae is influenced by temperature as we know. The more recent work has come out of Denmark where um, they found that temperature uh, affects the, uh, this pre-overposition, this pre-egg laying period where the adults are feeding in order to complete their development. Uh, the number of eggs that they lay is affected by temperature daily um, egg laying rate or overposition rate is affected by temperature as is uh, female longevity, egg development rate and egg viability. All of that's affected by uh, temperature and of course if we could understand how it's affected by temperature it would really help us in monitoring and understanding the risk posed in that season by cabbage stem flea beetle. So next slide please. So from this work that's been uh, done already, we know that uh, flea beetle eggs take just um, uh, 12 to 13 days to hatch if it's very warm, if it's 20 degrees centigrade, that's a constant 20 degrees centigrade. So it doesn't take into account uh, cooler nighttime. If however, it's really cool and it's maybe only four or five degrees, then egg hatch can take um, an extremely long period of time, anything from 100 to 180 days to hatch. So it really wouldn't be of any concern to us because they'd be taking just way too long to hatch. It's possible that egg hatch occurs more quickly under more natural fluctuating conditions. And I should say here that uh, what I'm going to talk about and what's been done previously, people tend to use constant temperatures when they do these kinds of studies. But what we should be thinking about is that, of course, it gets cooler at night and it's warmer during the day. And that may be important in, in driving egg hatch uh, uh, and indeed egg laying by cabbage stem flea beetle. We need to know more about this. So next slide, please. So what we did last year was we, um, we took um, uh, adult uh, flea beetles. Uh, we, um, we collected those uh, flea beetles at the end of July, early August at harvest. We then kept them in, in the uh, laboratory until the start of September, and then we exposed them to different temperature regimes. So we, we gave them a constant five degrees, a constant 10 degrees, a constant 15 degrees, and then a much more realistic fluctuating uh, 15 and five degrees. So five degrees to simulate overnight and 15 degrees to simulate a, typ a typical daytime uh, temperature. Now that range temperatures is not obviously going to capture all the environmental range that we may encounter um, when, when we uh, typically think about uh, adult flea beetle being active within an oilseed rate crop. But what it does is it gives us enough of a range to, uh, to look at the potential to model this data to give us some uh, predictive measures about how the beetles may be uh, behaving. So this is about data collection that we can then use. So next slide, please. So, um, as I say, the beetles were, were fed on oilseed rape leaves um, under uh, uh, laboratory conditions until the 1st of September. And then we played matchmaker. We took one male and one female. They didn't have any say in this. Each were placed in a uh, pair, were placed in a, a, a small plastic container that you can see at the bottom of the, the slide there with a single oilseed rape leaf. And then we had 25 pairs at each of those temperature regimes, the three constant temperatures and the fluctuating temperatures. And then we checked them every day for uh, seven months to see how many eggs they laid um, uh, on each day. So next slide, please. And what we found was that the time taken 
for the adults to start laying eggs. So this is, so the adults migrate into the crop, well, how long is it before they start laying eggs? And as you might expect, uh, the, the bottom um, of the uh, graph there, the 15 degrees uh, constant, um, shows us that the, uh, the uh, beetles were starting to lay eggs slightly earlier than at the 10 degrees constant at the top of the graph. So the different letters, where we see a different letter, uh, between A and B, we know that they're significantly different. Each of the blue dots indicates us an individual data point. Uh, so we've got uh, the time taken for each individual female to start laying, uh, laying eggs there. And the bar is indicating, with the uh, black dot in the middle, is indicating the mean length of time before egg laying starts. So we see a significant difference between the time taken for egg laying to start at 10 degrees versus 15 degrees. What we see is that fluctuating temperatures does appear to uh, slightly accelerate uh, the time taken for egg laying to start. It's not significantly different from the, the warmer 15 degrees constant. And what I should say about that is when it's fluctuating between 5 and 15 degrees centigrade with 12 hours at each, you can actually uh, do the, um, the uh, the, the average of the mean, that's exactly the same as far as an insect, um, if we talk about the thermal um, uh, day degrees that the insect is accumulating, that's the same as saying 10 degrees constant, but it seems here that it's not the same um, as simply uh, taking the mean of the fluctuating temperature, it's actually slightly faster than we would have predicted otherwise, so that cooler night, warmer day does seem to be speeding things up slightly. Now the five degrees constant appears that the eggs are being laid quite quickly, um, but that we can um, uh, fairly much exclude at the moment because we don't have enough data. Very few of the females laid any eggs at all at the five degrees constant, um, so we don't have much confidence in that data. So don't, don't read too much into that information there. Uh, next slide, please. Perhaps more uh, or just as interesting is the number of eggs that the, uh, the females are laid. And here we saw very little difference between uh, the 15 degrees constant at the top of this graph, the five and 15 degrees um, uh, uh, fluctuating temperature regime, which is the next one down, or the 10 degrees constant uh, temperature. So slight differences, but in general, the females laid similar numbers of eggs each. Each female, um, uh, laying anywhere between 50 and 100, uh, 100 eggs. At the five degrees, at the very cool conditions, the females really struggled to lay any eggs. So I think at five degrees, we're really at the threshold of when um, the beetles can be active and laying eggs within a crop. But warmer than that, they can, uh, they can develop and they can be laying eggs. Next slide, please. So, here we have our um, cabbage stem fee beetle eggs, and you'll notice on the left-hand side, slight to the top on the left-hand side, we've got um, some collapsed eggs. So these are eggs that have hatched out, and we can see the, the larva there um, slightly to the right-hand side of the, um, of the photograph. So here we were looking to see, okay, well, the eggs are being laid. How long does it take those eggs to hatch at those different temperatures? Uh, next slide, please. And here we see a really obvious difference. The eggs uh, at the 15 degrees constant are uh, hatching much more quickly than at the, uh, the 10 degrees constant or indeed at the fluctuating 5 and 15 degrees um, uh, temperature regime. At the 5 degrees constant temperature, we didn't see any eggs hatching. So this just gives more evidence that at 5 degrees, they just can't develop. We're right at the limits of what the, the insect can uh, uh, um, uh, can develop at. But importantly, what we're finding here is that um, the fluctuating temperature is indeed speeding up the, the uh, time to egg hatch. And at the 10 degrees, hopefully you can all see the spread of those blue dots showing that it's much more variable. As we have cooler temperatures, the time taken for those eggs to hatch really becomes much more variable than compared with when we have the warmer 15 degrees uh, uh, constant temperature or indeed the fluctuating uh, temperature. So there's something going on there but we don't fully understand at the moment as to why we have this variability in time to egg hatch. Uh, next slide please. And the other uh, big difference is egg, egg viability. Egg viability is highest at the warmest conditions so it seems that egg viability decreases in line with temperature and we have no viable eggs at five degrees constant, whereas we have a, around 75% viability of the eggs at warmer conditions. 
So a warmer year, where we would be um, a concluding from this is going to lead to greater viability of the eggs, and that would, of course, lead to greater pest pressure. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what have we learned from this? Well, if we're trying to uh, to make predictions about um, uh, when um, uh, cabbage and flea beetle going to be active, when egg laying is going to happen, and when larval invasion is going to take place, we've seen that there's variation both in the time to start of egg laying and egg hatch, and this is happening even under our carefully controlled laboratory um, conditions. So. That very variation makes it difficult for us to um, uh, have confidence in, um, in producing a, uh, a robust monitoring system. So we need to do some more work here, but uh, we're starting to get a handle on how temperature is influencing the biology of the, uh, of the pest. It does seem that fluctuating conditions um, make things go quicker. The egg hatch in particular is much faster under fluctuating conditions than under a constant 10 degrees centigrade, which should be the same speed of development as the fluctuating 15 and 5 degrees, but it doesn't seem to be true. As you saw, there's a great deal of variability. It's possible there's something else going on. It's not just temperature that's having an effect here. And we know of other pests, particularly I'm thinking here about um, orange wheat blossomage, that needs temperature, but it also needs moisture in order to complete its um, uh, development. And that may be true here for egg hatch. So it may be that uh, moisture relative humidity is very important, or it may be that um, uh, a, uh, a, a sudden change in temperature, maybe a, a frosty night is important in triggering egg hatch. If that's true, then we would have hard triggers or hard um, points that would um, allow us to, um, uh, to build models that would uh, indicate when um, larval invasion of the, uh, the plant is going to take place. And if that's true, then we can have much more certainty on whether we should be going earlier or later with our uh, drilling dates uh, in order to, um, uh, to escape larval damage, as Steve's already been explaining. Uh, next slide, please. So there's some work ongoing in this project. Um, we need to understand what those egg hatch triggers are, if indeed they, uh, they exist. Is it humidity? Is it temperature change? We've got some data that suggests temperature change may be uh, important, but we need to do more work on that. We need to understand the impact of temperature on the speed of larval development. We need to see how quickly they can grow at different temperatures within the crop. And we need to confirm the numbers of entry and exit holes made by each larvae. Now, we don't have um, um, foliar applications of, um, of insecticide that we uh, can apply or effectively uh, apply with uh, widespread pyrethroid resistance. But if we did have controls that um, became available, it'd be really good to know if the larvae are entering and exit, exiting the plant and how many times they do that, because every time they exit the plant um, it would make them vulnerable to, a, uh, to a, a foliar application of an insecticide. So that's something that we, uh, we're, we're keen to look at. We know that we, they do um, uh, 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 leave the plant and then go back in the plant, but we don't know how often they do that through their development. Uh, next slide, please. And the other work we, we want to understand, which is, is very in line with um, what Steve was talking about, um, when we're looking at um, uh, different seed rates uh, and the timing of uh, larval invasion, we would like to know uh, under much more um, uh, reproducible conditions um, how the number of um, uh, larvae infesting a plant is going to affect um, uh, plant growth. The timing of infestation, so the crop growth stage at which that infestation happens, and then the size of the plant, particularly the stem width of the plant, does that um, uh, really, as Steve was um, uh, uh, suggesting, give the plant that much more um, uh, resilience to uh, larval invasion? So that's what work. These are going to be done as pot studies where we're going to artificially infest the plants uh, with cabbage uh, stem flea beetle larvae to understand how. Uh, the number of larvae invading the plants, the timing of invasion in terms of crop growth stage, uh, and then the size of the plants in terms of stem width um, as a result of uh, different densities of plants, how that affects uh, the resilience of the, of the plant. And then the final uh, part there, we want to understand how the relative attractiveness of different plant ages uh, affects adult behavior. Do they prefer to feed on the very youngest leaves or will they feed on older leaves? Uh, and again, that would come back to um, providing um, uh, trap crops and understanding how best to use uh, best to use them. 
So we've got a second poll, and, and again, Steve um, has already alluded um, uh, to this already. So work that ADAS have done has shown uh, that uh, increasing seed rate uh, may not be that effective at diluting the damage, but there seems to be some evidence that reducing the seed rate produces a more resilient plant. So just interested to know if either of these approaches is being used and, uh, uh, and, and by how many. So uh, really interested to see what, uh, uh, what result we get here. How are we going with that one, Christian? Most people voted. Just coming up to over halfway again, so I'll give it another few seconds. Fantastic. Thanks very much. We'll close it in a couple of seconds now. Fantastic. So um, several people try any uh, increased seed, seed rates, fairly even split there between that and going the other way. And I think in a nutshell, this, this is everything about cabbage stem flea beetle, isn't it? That we are really conflicted with which way to go. Should we be increasing or decreasing um, the seed rate uh, in order to um, uh, get the best management of, uh, of this pest? And I think that's where the work that Steve's describing will be really useful and hopefully uh, we can uh, provide some underpinning um, uh, data to show which of these approaches is going to be the most uh, most effective. Of course it's going to vary with um, crop situation but I think this is where we really need some some clearer guidance to know which way to which way should we should be jumping with this. Brilliant, uh, next slide please. So just to finish on a, on a, a more uh, uh, positive, I guess, something that's uh, hopefully coming down the line in a, in a few years. So this is the second project that I highlighted at the start. This is where we're looking at future potential controls. And this is a good example of why we want to know when the larvae may be leaving, uh, leaving the plants or not. So this is um, a project that's uh, being led by, um, uh, by Claire here at, at Harper Adams. And Claire's just recently done a, a podcast um, that uh, should be available where she talks much more about um, the work that she's doing through uh, through her PhD. And in a sense, in, in essence rather, um, what Claire's doing is looking at a range of biopesticides um, that may be already being used in different crop situations, particularly in the horticultural um, uh, cropping situations, and to see could any of those be applied to oilseed rate for the control of cabbage stem flea beetle. So I don't have very much time uh, this evening, but just to highlight two interesting um, uh, pieces of uh, uh, work already. And the first of these is, uh, oh, can we just go back a slide, please, Christian? Brilliant, thank you. Uh, the first of these is that um, uh, organisms called uh, uh, entomopathogenic nematodes, a bit of a mouthful, but these are uh, nematode uh, species that will um, infect and kill uh, insects. And they will, uh, as you can see here, they will infect and kill cabbage stem flea beetle. So they've got some atrocious names, I'm afraid, but uh, on the left hand side, we've got the control mortality. And then we've got the first of our nematode species, which is Heterodytus bacteriophora. And what you need to take from that is that um, we're getting almost 100% um, uh, kill, or we are getting 100% kill at the highest um, concentration of uh, nematodes. Uh, there uh, and we're getting killed quite quickly uh, in just after two days uh, we're getting up to 100% kill at the highest concentration or at uh, more realistic concentrations uh, we're getting um, over 75% uh, mortality in the uh, adult cabbage stem flea beetle. Now the challenge with um, um, uh, these uh, nematodes will be the application and making it cost effective but at this stage, we're just trying to see which of these may be um, potentially useful controls that we could consider for the uh, for the future. So here we we, we seem to have got some uh, some useful control uh, using a range of nematode species, particularly this first one, Heterobitus. Uh, next next slide, please, Christian. And again, looking at control of the uh, the adults uh, and thinking about products that. Um, have them um, essentially plant extracts. These are um, uh, products that can be applied using conventional um, spray application uh, technologies. And what we're seeing here, so uh, Flipper is a, um, a product that's widely used in the horticultural sector. Um, it's considered to be a physically active um, acting um, uh, uh, insecticide or biopesticide, whichever term you prefer to use. And uh, we have a coded product from um, uh, from one of the co-sponsors of this project from CERTIS uh, and what we can see is in both cases 
uh, we're getting good levels of control, particularly uh, the standout in this uh, instance is Flipper, which is get, giving very rapid control. The middle uh, concentration air of 10 uh, millilitres per litre would be the recommended rate uh, as per the, uh, the label uh, that's used in the horticultural sector. And as you can see, it's giving uh, very good control uh, very quickly within one day of application. And we're not quite sure how it's working or not certain, but the, the two images on the right hand side, the first one shows how the insect cuticle should look. And then below, we can see what Flip is doing to the insect cuticle. It's, uh, it's almost like crazy paving. It's producing damage to the insect cuticle. So it may be that that damage, uh, typically we think about the insect dehydrating uh, when we uh, we apply products such as uh, such as Flipper. So again, very early stage, this is laboratory work, but we have some encouraging results here. So hopefully down the line, alongside what um, uh, Steve's been uh, presenting in terms of um, IPM uh, compatible strategies, we have other IPM uh, compatible uh, controls that we uh, can look to introduce. But these won't be silver bullets. These aren't going to uh, simply uh, resolve the, uh, the flea beetle problem, but hopefully can be used alongside those other, uh, other controls that, uh, that Steve's been discussing. Uh, next slide, please. And that's, that's a, a quick run through uh, the work we've been uh, doing. This is just a, another illustration from, from Claire's work of a dead uh, cabbage stem flea beetle adult, this time being killed by a fungal, uh, a fungal pathogen. So I thought I'd leave you with a happy sign there of a, a dead cabbage stem flea beetle adult. Thanks, Rose. Thank you, Tom. Um, that's certainly an, an, a new picture for me as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I hope... <laughs> I hope uh, that's aided in, in giving you all a better understanding um, of the bio biology of cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, and it's interesting to see the transparency of what's been looked at going forwards. So just conscious of time um, and hopefully I will press the right button. But we've got a heap of questions in, which is um, really quite fantastic. So I'm going to quick fire round them at you. Um, Tom, Steve, I don't know if you want to sort of um, debate between yourselves um, efficiently as to who's going to answer each question. Um, but we did just have a couple of questions in before the webinar. So if we start with those, um, if planting before the 20th of August into a moist seabed with good consolidate consolidation by rolling, are companion crops worthwhile, do you think? Um, and then it's sort of, if so, which companion crops have demonstrated benefits in rapeseed establishment in less favourable conditions? Right, well, I guess, I, I guess that one comes down to me. And the simple answer is, I don't think we really know. Um, uh, so it's basically saying if you can establish if you can establish the crop early and get it away, do you need to uh, do you need to worry about a companion crop? And I guess the simple answer is to that is probably no. But I guess the difficulty is knowing whether or not you're going to get that good level of establishment. And I guess this might well be where we refer back to your yen rows where we're, we're talking about um, establishment and how people establish the crop and can we pick up anything there that would allow us to provide some guidelines of how to achieve best establishment so um, I don't think I can answer that question at any I, I can I've, I've made a note of it and I'll see if any of my colleagues have uh, any other answers and we can always relay them uh, in the future if, if if that would help. Fab. Um, and then not so much regards cabbage stem flea beetle on the cotyledons, um, but please, how are we going to avoid and or cure the larvae in the stems? Control larvae in the stems. Right, well, the, the, I mean, the, the larvae don't appear to move into the stems until much later in the season now again um we're not sure what the trigger is to or the, the thing that triggers larvae to move from the leaves to the stems now that set you would you would sort of think that temperature would probably be important and as it gets colder you look for somewhere uh, warmer to hold up so you move into the stems um but but we're not quite sure about that at all so 
we, we need to know much more about, about that. And this is perhaps where Tom's work is, is going to come into play. But um, in terms of controlling larvae, then it, it, the, the, the other option is, to, well, I guess to, to, to be devil's advocate is to say, well, do we actually need to control them at all? Because if we can produce plants which are sufficiently robust to tolerate the level of feeding that those larvae are going to produce, is that an alternative way to go? So again, I don't think this is necessarily a very satisfactory answer. Um, I think there are ways you can you can combat larvae. You can you can try defoliation, as I said before. You can sow early uh, and produce robust plants. But other than that, there or, or you can reduce your seed rate and produce again produce more robust plants. But other than that, I don't think we've necessarily got any answers at the moment. Now, whether some of what Tom was suggesting might come into play in the future, where you may be able to apply, I don't know, nematodes or some entomopathogenic fungus to to the crop at perhaps a slightly reduced rate, so it's less costly, that would give you sufficient control of the pest to enable the, the, the crop to continue growing. So, yeah, it's the, unfortunately with this, the, the, there's no simple answers, Rose. Um, and it's all things that, that, that we need to continue to look at. Could I just jump in there and say that the, if you're seeing um, larvae and stems early, be sure you're looking at cabbage stem flea beetle because there's a very real chance you're looking at rape winter stem weevil. Um, I've seen lots of photos recently, um, and I saw one uh, just today of what was purported to be cabbage stem flea beetle, but it, it was a weevil larva, and um, can't say for sure, but it looked like it was probably, it was either rape winter stem weevil or um, cabbage stem weevil, so um, it won't be that in the, in the autumn, but if you are seeing um, uh, stem, uh, stem boring pests, be really clear that it's cabbage stem flea beetle or not rape winter stem weevil. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, how far can or do adults travel to find food? Oh, God. You keep, you keep <laughs> trying good, out these questions. It's like Tom said, you, you don't realise how much you don't know about this flaming thing until you actually need to know it. And because we've been able to kill it for decades with a, a simple spray, Nobody's really worried about how far it flies. So um, I, I would, I would imagine, uh, what one so, to two kilometers? They're, they're fairly yeah. robust beasts, and they can fly upwind. I think, and, and pro probably attracted by the odor of the crop. So, uh, what one to two kilometers? At a rough guess, I think that's that's only what I've seen reported, but. How good that data is, I, I don't, I don't know. But that's only been been reported. Once they get into the crop, they they, they lose the ability to fly. Then then they're they're more restricted. So, um, but yeah, um, they're certainly capable of moving considerable considerable distances. It's not simply that they're restricted to yeah you know, the field next door. They can they can go go much further than that. Yeah. So while we're just mentioning adult activity, um, is that also dependent on rainfall too? Do you think? I I I would imagine it probably was, because generally speaking, when it rains, the temperature drops. So um, the the sort of things go together. And I mean, if if you're if you imagine you're an insect in, in a in an all seed rape crop, I mean, I think. I think rainfall will certainly affect the ability to migrate. And I think if you're an insect in an all seed rape crop as well, um, if you have heavy rain, that's liable to have some sort of deleterious effect on you. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to kill them off, just like rain doesn't kill off aphids, but it, it probably is going to have some effect. But I, I wouldn't like people to go away thinking that, Oh well, it's chucked it down with rain. That that's that's finished them off because I'm fairly certain that wouldn't be the case. Thank you. And last question. Um, conscious of time, we'll um, wrap it up. I'm hoping that at the end of this, um, you will help me answer the questions later on with those that we haven't asked this evening. But yeah, no um, 
bearing in mind that I think a lot of oilseed rape is now established as cheaply as possible, uh, has anyone assessed the effect of leaving chopped straw on a mintill seedbed? I, I think there has been some work done on that. Um, and I, I, if I remember rightly, there was a suggestion again there that the presence of the straw could interfere with the ability of the adults to find the developing seedlings. Um, I guess one thing that you might, you might worry about there is the potential to encourage the likes of slugs as well. Um, because I can remember, you know, I've slugs in and uh, in all seed rape is, is another pretty major problem. I mean, the last thing you want to do is is combat um, Devastem flebe or then fall foul to slugs. So uh, I think there has been some work done on it. Um, we can check that out with with Sasha, and uh, he's he's probably got some references on it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all very much for your questions this evening. Um, unfortunately, we haven't got through them all, but like I say, we will um, do our best to follow those up in the next few days. So just quickly to finish on this evening, um, we do have resources available. Um, if you log on to our website, ahdb.org.uk, um, there's all sorts of things there, recommended lists, um, nutrient management guides, etc. Um, and then if we go on to the next slide, thank you. There's our publications, uh, which are available. If you ensure that your keeping in touch details are up to date, then um, if you don't sort of download these individually, um, uh, they will come through to you automatically. And then the last slide for this evening, um, not forgetting our business tools that are available. Um, please, you know, if any of this is of interest to you and you're struggling to access it or not 100% sure which direction to go in, um, by all means, get in touch with me or your local knowledge exchange manager um, and anybody, everybody will be willing to help. So following this webinar, there will be a survey come round. Please just take two minutes to fill it in. Your feedback is always very much appreciated. Um, and also, like I said at the beginning, this webinar has been recorded. So I know there's been a whole heap of information um, transferred this morning. So please go back through it and um, have a look at those slides again. And like I say, if you've got any further questions or queries, don't hesitate to get in touch with me um, and we'll do our best to try and, and suss it out. Our next webinar um, is in August. It's our 2021 harvest update, um, and that will be at the usual time of seven o'clock. Um, so it will be um, coming round on the email as usual. If not, do have a look at our events page on the website. And not forgetting that um, Steve's mentioned, and I did at the very beginning, the Earl C. Yen Establishment Beauty Contest. Um, do have a look about it and, and have a read and get involved. Um, but similarly, again, you know, any struggles, don't hesitate to get in touch. So finally, that leaves me um, again to thank Tom and Steve very much for joining us this evening um, and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Um, it, it really is the most colossal subject. Uh, and I think if this was a two hour webinar, we'd probably struggle to even touch the surface of it. So um, uh, the ongoing work really does look in intriguing and fingers crossed we can suss out a plan of attack um, going forwards. And I think bearing in mind where rate prices are at the minute, we're um, all seriously looking at it again. So Christian, um, the man behind the curtain, thank you very much. Um, sterling job as always. Um, but yeah, without further ado, um, I hope you all enjoy the football. You've got 20 minutes to go and get yourselves parked on the sofa and, and find a drink. Um, thank you all very, very much. Um, and I'll bid you a good night.